Mr. Carr. That was the final House vote on Manitoba Liberal MP Jim Carr's private member's bill C-235. It passed 176 to 137. Now, the bill would see federal ministers work together with all levels of government, the private sector, and indigenous communities to build a green economy in the prairie provinces. And the man behind this new framework, Jim Carr, is here with me now. Mr. Hi, Carr, it's, it's very good to see you. Too long. Uh, talk, take us through this bill. What is in this bill, and, and why is this so important to you? Because it's rare we see private members' bills become law like this. Yeah, imagine a table that needs another five or eight leaves in it. <laughs> and sitting where those leaves will be added are uh, municipal governments, provincial governments, indigenous communities, unions, people who want to be heard, people who want a seat at the table, who haven't had it, all pulling together towards combined and national aspirations. So this creates the framework for the green transition, specifically right. for the prairie provinces. Yes. They're very uh, carbon exposed, to, to, to coin a phrase, I guess, in terms of where their economies are. I mean, how, how exactly do you see this working? Because I, I don't want to break it to you, but things aren't mm. going great between you guys and some of the prairie provinces right now. Well, we're not fancy. <laughs> no. Especially across the prairie. Yep. Uh, so we'll see. They have a mandate and they have to report back to Parliament and that's a feature of the bill that I like the most because it's not good enough just to gab. You have to say to parliamentarians, we've been at this for a year and here is what we have done so far. Here's where we intend to go. And it's the report back that's different about the bill and I think it what makes it compulsive and compelling. You expect you'll get buy-in, though, from provinces like Saskatchewan right now under Premier Mo and Alberta under Premier Smith? I mean, we've seen the mm -hmm. Saskatchewan First Act, the Alberta Sovereignty Act. Yeah. They, they would look at a big federal committee as something barging into their jurisdiction, potentially. Yeah, but unfortunately, they get it exactly wrong because it's not top-down, it's bottom-up. It's people who have not been consulted before. There's no overreach here. Everything that we're discussing is in federal jurisdiction mm -hmm. with the added value of these people who have an opinion and they've not been asked for one and they will be. So once this is up and running, how do you see it operating? Like, how, you know, give me a tangible example of, of how this works and, and gets the prairie provinces further along this path to this green transition. Yeah, you know, David, it could be applicable anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the prairies because I'm a prairie guy. I get it. I yeah. love the prairie as you love Newfoundland and Labrador. And as I said to my friends in the block the other day, it's the same kind of sense of identity and belonging to a geography and a demography. So I think it's a way in which people will be heard in ways that matter to them. And that's been one of the unfortunate realities of the politics of the prairie. We, my party, the Liberal Party, have not been able to resonate in ways that matter. And that's because we have to show up more often, but not empty-handed. I spent many, many months as the uh, minister responsible for the prairie, and in my second floor at home, I uh, was able to make tracks and mm -hmm. talk to literally thousands of people. That, I suppose, was one of the advantages of the pandemic. You can talk to hundreds or more and get a sense of what it is that riles them, irks them, uh, aspirations that are shared values and now uh, federal ministers will have to buy in mm -hmm. and be accountable to Parliament. You know, your love of the prairie, you mentioned my love of Newfoundland and Labrador, but also yeah. an oil-reliant jurisdiction, right? Yes. That is, you know, 30 years after transitioning from cod, they have to start the process of transitioning from carbon and there are political components, industry components and just ordinary average people who want to resist that because of the economic stakes that that that, that means for them. So I mean, what have you got to do to, to move that conversation along and not make it so bitterly contested? Because while there is some buy-in, I mean, you see the bare-knuckled nature of some yeah. of this debate at, at the political level, right? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, they have to transition as the rest of us will transition, mostly driven by international market forces. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's the movement of capital that is driving public policy decisions uh, across the country and worldwide. So that's the context, that's the framework, and people want jobs. They're sitting around the dinner table now, the lunch table, depend on the time zone, yep. and they're asking themselves the question, uh, where will my sons and daughters be working in the new energy environment? And I have a lot of faith in the entrepreneurship of Albertans. They've been driving 
wealth creation and economic growth for decades, and they will continue to. Sometimes I think I have more faith in their natural political uh, representatives are showing. And I have faith because over decades they've proven uh, that the smart money will go where the markets are leading them to be. So uh, this framework that's been created by this bill, does that become, you know, to use the supper table, dinner table uh -huh. analogy, does that become the table where you decide how to, the change is coming. You can either steer it or have it imposed upon you, right? In, in terms yeah. of how the economy is going to transition. Does this become yeah, well put. The, the, yeah, the big national dinner table where that conversation I hope so. Is that what you uh, hope? Uh, the leaves will be at the consulting table. Yep. Uh, the informal conversations will be at the dinner table. And I think a lot of decisions are actually made there because if you look at what I believe to be a grassroots on up framework, which it's going to have to be if it's going to carry political weight, uh, then Canadians, Albertans, and those from my province in Saskatchewan are going to be given the opportunity to be here, to right. be heard. When I first met you, you were a full-on cabinet minister. You've been, you've been open since 2019 about the health challenges you're facing. Yeah. I, I, on a day like this where you get this through, I just wonder, how are you doing now? How are you feeling? Well, I mean, physically not great, uh, but uh, emotionally, really, really solid. And grateful for the chance to continue to contribute to my country. I said in my speech yesterday, uh, I love every square meter of this country in English, <laughs> en français, in indigenous languages, I wish I spoke more of them, in the language of the newly arrived and all that that represents to Canada and Canadians. Well, Jim Carr, congratulations on, on getting the, the dinner table at least start to be built, perhaps, or the conversation that will be built with the passing of the private member. It was good to see you. Thanks for coming and in. And good to see you, too.